say welcome. Say welcome. All right, I'd mute that. Uh, let's see. Is it possible to get? some music here maybe let's see not let's see here well as we're getting ready here might be some It's not too loud. Very mild. Something in the background. Should be fine. So today I am going to be discussing probably start that over lower that down. The music's too loud, it's just most mostly just background failure, so it's not meant to be very loud. Okay. All right, so today I'm going to be discussing the question, what is a lay Dominican? Now, I do not propose to be a, uh, an expert on the subject. Uh, however, um, I did want to spend a little bit of time talking about what I do know. And I figured the best way of doing that is to go through this uh, pamphlet uh, by uh, uh, a priest in the Dominican order. Father John uh, Roba. He wrote this pamphlet, uh, the Third Order of Saint Dominic. So, I'll be re I'll be reading and commenting on that uh, today, and also discussing anything that pops up in chat during the time. So, uh, with that, I'll probably start in Dominican fashion here and just do some quick prayers on behalf of all Dominicans, which is a very Dominican thing to do, I should say. So, so we'll begin, in all many patries, at Fili, at Spiritu Sancti, Amen. No cap. And we'll do the Our Father and the Hail Mary. Pastor Noster, quies in celis, sanctificator nomen tuum, et veniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cello et in terra, Panem nostrum, quotidianum da nobis odie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationum, sed libera nos amalo. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in molieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tu Iesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, or pro nobis, peccatoribus nunc, and to hor mortis nostris. Gloria Patri, et Filio, et Spiritui Sancto, sicut erat in principio, et nunc et semper, et in secula seculorum. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord. 
and let perpetual light shine upon them. May the souls of the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. Some prayers for some Dominicans there. All right, so we're going to take a look at this pamphlet. What is the third order of St. Dominic? Why is this relevant to me? Um, well, I'm in the discernment process of entering into the D Dominican order as a, uh, as a lay member. Okay. So uh, let's get started here. Uh, I suppose we can start with the forward. So we're going to be reading through this booklet. This booklet is addressed primarily, but not exclusively, to our beloved brothers and sisters in the Third Order of St. Dominic, also known as the uh, Dominican laity, or lay Dominicans. This booklet is not an official or complete compendium of the rule or history of the Third Order, but it is hopefully an aid to its appreciation, a stimulus to arouse a greater apostolic zeal in its present membership, and an endeavor to attract new vocations. A vocation comes directly from God, like a ray of light penetrating the most intimate and deepest recesses of one's conscience. The tertiary vocation is a, I think that's the right word, is a reassuring sign of predestination, a proof of special love for Mary, the mother of God, and of Mary's special love for the tertiary. It is a bilateral contract of love between the church and the tertiary, which should not be entered upon without sufficient reflection, counsel, and prayer. And as we'll see, the, uh, the, the process of discerning one's call takes many, many years the Christian vocation, in general, is by its nature a call to the apostolate, for faith without works is dead. The duty of the apostolate derives from Christian baptism and confirmation. For the, faith, for the fruitful exercise of this apostolate, the Holy Spirit gives special gifts called charisms. Indeed, the tertiary vocation is itself a charism whose basic norm is the following of Christ, but whose special objective is striving for the perfection of gospel life under the guidance of the Dominican rule in constitutions as exemplified by St. Dominic and the Seraph Doctor St. Catherine of Siena. The Dominican laity has its origin in one of the 12th century penitential movements which centered around St. Dominic Guzman, gentle athlete fast knit to Christ. Father and founder of the, the Order of Preachers, the term Order of Preachers or uh, abbreviated OP, um, is just referring to someone who is a member of the Dominican Order. During regular meetings of the local chapters, newcomers are afforded ample opportunity to study the life of this holy founder and to abide his spirit the tertiary manner of life is modest, cheerful, outgoing. Lay Dominicans make a commitment or profession to seek the kingdom of God as Dominic and Catherine did by prayer and an apostolate adapted to the changed conditions and realities of society. Welcome all these realities because the church is called to become a new humanity in Christ, said Pope John Paul II. While sharing the charism of their founder, the Dominican lady strive to embrace the objectives. No, no cat. Okay. Where was I? While sharing the charism of their founder, the Dominican lady strive to embrace the objectives which the church considers, considers most important today. Although times have changed notably, basic values still retain their primacy. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. The salvation of souls is the first and perennial goal of the Dominican order. The order's motto is truth, and its spirit is charity. The mind and heart of Dominic and of Catherine were ablaze with the truth and charity of Christ, Jesus as God revealed to the Seraph Virgin of Siena. 
it looks like it's quoting uh, quoting uh, Catherine of Siena here. Uh, Jesus speaking to her. All right. Beloved daughter, I have begotten two sons, one by nature, the other by a sweet and tender adoption. From his birth until the last moment of his life, Dominic, my son by adoption, followed my will in all things. I tell you that Dominic, in nearly all his words, is like my natural son. Even his body resembled the sacred body of my only beloved son. My only beloved son devoted his whole life to the salvation of souls. Dominic, my adopted son, directed all his mind and efforts to saving souls from the snares of error and vice. That was the chief object which led him to found and train his order. Therefore, I tell you that in all his acts, he may be compared to my begotten son. And that's what it means to be a Christian too, isn't it? To uh, kind of reflect Christ. The tertiary vocation is superior to membership in a sodality or confraternity because it includes canonical status in a major religious order and embraces a more universal objective. However, tertiaries are not priests or nuns. They are laymen and women, single or married, whose goal is the practice of penance and the apostolate in the world, not in the cloister. They are a sign in the midst of the world. The qualities expected of them are not excessive, simply that they be practical Catholics, devout, reasonable, prayerful, lovers of the liturgy, loyal to the Pope, conscious of the immense value of their vocation and resolved to preserve in it do, during their lifetime. Naturally, this requires a profound commitment to the gospel, high moral standards, avoidance of worldliness, a spirit of self-sacrifice and zeal for the eternal and temporal welfare of the neighbor. The Dominican laity is an international family, a worldwide movement of apostolic cooperation within the whole Dominican family. It is a lay proclamation of the gospel. Its history spans almost eight centuries and numbers in its family thousands of saintly lay men and women from every corner of the world. The emerging laymen receive Special accommodation during Second Vatican II. It stated, quote, The layman's apostolate is so necessary that the church can never be without it. The laity have important roles to play if they are to be fellow workers for the truth. In exemplifying truth in the modern world, the lay apostolate and the, and the pastoral ministry complement each other. This is the second Vatican document on the laity. Molded on the traditions and examples of myriad Dominicans who now stand before the throne of God, they are one with them in the bonds of a loving brotherhood that begins on earth and is consummated in the bliss of heaven. Conversion of heart through the spirit and practice of evangelical penance. Looks like this is derived from Fundamental Rule 1.6.6. Conversion of heart involves the rooting out of vices and the planting of virtues through regulated self-discipline. The rule makes little mention of corporeal penances, such as were practiced by saints of the order. Nevertheless, Pope Paul VI warned that you must guard against softening of discipline which is not dictated by real necessity, but by a spirit of presumption and intolerance of obedience or by love of the world. End quote. It's by Pope Paul VI. True reformers like Dominic and Catherine reformed themselves first of all. Their disciples, the, the, the Dominican laity, must strive habitually to renew themselves by an ongoing conversion of heart. This requires avoidance of habitual sin, a reasonable asceticism, seeking perfection by means of 
corporeal austerity should be guided by competent spiritual direction. What is the evangelical penance or conversion of heart recommended by the rule? It is essentially the self-denial required for growth in the love of God and neighbor, the deepening of the interior life of grace, fidelity to the duties of one's state in life, avoidance of deliberate sin, mortification of one's predominant passion. It is principally interior and invisible. It is awareness and acceptance of the will of God in all circumstances, whether agreeable or disagreeable. The world expects a tertiary to live an unselfish life, void of scandal and marked by patience, helpfulness, detachment from worldly ambition, and craving for wealth. A quotation from Hosea looks like, I want a loving heart rather than sacrifice, knowledge of my ways rather than holocausts, sacrifices. Knowledge of God's ways implies a loving knowledge, or contemplation of God's will as revealed in the Gospels and spelled out in the tertiary rule. Looks like a picture here of Catherine cutting her hair to discourage parental insistence on her marriage. Uh, Catherine of Siena did not want to marry. She wanted to uh, live the religious life. A loving heart is one that is modeled after the compassionate heart of Jesus, a victim for sin. Among the reasonable and practical penances suitable for tertiaries of any age or state of life, the following are praiseworthy. All right, so here are some good uh, rules for holiness. Avoidance of luxury and dress, food, and general lifestyle. St. Dominic was, oh, this word, abstemious at table, fasted perpetually. His habit was poor and patched. Two, generosity and almsgiving. Almsgiving, the biblical practice of tithing. Uh, Dominic was generous and hospitable and gladly gave all he had to the poor, even offering to sell himself to ransom the captive son of a poor widow. St. Thomas, I think it's probably referring to St. Thomas Aquinas, who was a Dominican. Uh, St. Thomas considers almsgiving the most meritorious work of mercy. Cheerful acceptance of failures, humiliations, loneliness, inclement weather, and all other forms of suffering, and a spirit of reparation for sin and for the conversion of sinners. 4. Faithful attendance at all meetings of the chapter and cheerful cooperation in its projects. 5. Voluntary abstinence from meat on Fridays and fasting on April 29th, August 7th, and October 6th, vigils respectively of the Feast of St. Catherine, St. Dominic, and Our Lady of the Rosary. 6. Since the Dominican lady belonged to an order of penance, they should devote themselves to works of penance and mortification more than the rest of the faithful. But individual tertiaries are free to perform whatever works of penance facilitate growth and virtue. Penitential exercises are means to an end. The end is charity. Love is the fulfillment of the law. Romans 13, 8. Every tertiary, as every Christian, must have a personal apostolate flowing from his personal spiritual life, where advisable chapters may have a chapter apostolate, something that the group does together. This comes from Statute 6. The deteriorating moral condition of modern society demands that the apostolate of the lady be broadened and intensified. There are innumerable opportunities open to the Dominican lady for this purpose. New problems are arising and very serious errors are circulating which tend to under undermine the moral order. Charitable activity can and should reach out to all persons in needs. Wherever there are people in need of food and drink, clothing, housing, medicine, employment, education, wherever men suffer illness, exile, or imprisonment, 
There, Christian charity should seek them out, find and console them. Deserving of special honor in the church are those lay people, single or married, who devote themselves with professional skill, either permanently or temporarily, to the service of associations and their activities. Group and individual apostolates for lay Dominicans exist in the home, the parish, in the diocese, and society at large. The sanctification of the home should be the primary apostolate of married tertiaries to ensure high spiritual standards, regular family prayer, especially the rosary, and to create an atmosphere of domestic happiness in which Christian character and vocations to the religious life germinate. It all starts in the home with the family. Such was the Guzman household in which the saintly mother, Blessed Joan, reared St. Dominic, and the Benin Casa family, where a devoted father protected the extraordinary vocation of his daughter, St. Catherine. Individual apostolates will vary according to the intellectual, social, and financial condition of each tertiary. Those qualified may use their talents to sponsor study clubs, Bible classes, conferences with popular guest speakers, or in writing letters of praise or protest to the news media. In other words, um, a very strong um, activity in spreading the gospel. The letters of St. Catherine, burning with love for Christ and the church, molded the opinions and consciences of many in contemporary society. She was very influential in her writings and influencing kings and queens and popes. And it was, I read a little bit about her story and it's quite fascinating just how much influence that she had just by writing letters. But the letters had their force because they respected her and her sanctity. Tertiaries may adopt foreign and domestic missions and lend support to various Catholic charities and other wor worthy forms of philanthropy. Visiting the sick at home or in hospitals, participating in the parish liturgy, leadership in parish organizations, promoting prayer groups, Eucharistic vigils and pilgrimages, distributing religious li literature, these are all commendable and practical apostolates broadly based on the gospel. The apostolate and the social milieu, that is the effort to infuse a Christian spirit into the mentality, customs, laws, and structures of the community in which one lives, is so much the responsibility of the lady that it can never be performed properly by others. Uh, another way of, of framing this is the level of involvement by the Dominicans is very strong. And in fact, the, I think it may be in Vietnam or some other country where most of the leadership in the parishes are lay Dominicans. And uh, th those chapters are growing tremendously because they're so involved in shaping the parish life and in participating in roles of leadership. All right, so statute 5B3. 15 minutes of thoughtful reading of sacred scripture may be substituted for praying any form of the office. I don't know if this is still true today because um, every now and then certain things get tweaked in terms of discipline uh, within the order. Um, but it is important, for instance, to reflect upon scripture. And one way of doing that that is in the form of the office or the office is to, uh, referring to the liturgy of the hours, is to spend 15 minutes going through the um, the office of readings in 
the liturgy of the hours. It is generally required to play uh, to pray at lauds and vespers. That's morning and evening prayer. It is not required, from what I can tell, to pray any other parts of the liturgy of the hours. But if you do the office of readings, you are spending time with sacred scripture uh, along with um, a second reading that is based on like Vatican II or um, some letter from a saint like Augustine or Irenaeus or something like that, an early church father. So lay Dominicans should cultivate a special affection for sacred scripture. Read it daily and memorize favorite passages for ready quotation and conversation or in prayer. Our primitive constitutions decreed that one of the three books possessed by every friar was to be a copy of scripture. Jesus himself prayed scripturally and quoted it with irresistible power. He rebuked the Sadducees because you know not the scriptures. And when the disciples on the way of to Emmaus were losing faith in the resurrection promise, Jesus opened up the scriptures to them. And wasn't it like a fire burning in us? In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus calmly submitted to the crowd with swords and clubs because the scriptures say it must happen this way. All right. The mother of Jesus knew the scriptures well. Some of the most charming passages are hers. She undoubtedly told scripture stories to the child Jesus and prayed together with him and Joseph in the language of the Psalms. She contributed to the New Testament her prophetic Magnificat, which is an essential part of the church's evening song. Uh, even song. Uh, in fact, the Magnificat is in the Liturgy of the Hours. It's prayed at Vespers, so we actually pray through the Magnificat. I'll be right back. <laughs> Cats are going crazy. All right, sorry, brother. In about 30 minutes, my kids will be home, so we get loud that way, too. All right, the Magnificat. Yeah, what's really interesting is that when you read the Magnificat, Mary takes on a whole new dimension because it's her longest speaking role in Scripture. And when you read it, it, it seems very well composed and has great depth to it. And she even, and it's said to be prophetic as well, um, especially that for all generations will call her blessed, which we we do. Uh, every generation refers refers to her as the Blessed Virgin Mary, in fulfillment of her, that prophecy. So from her motherly heart and pure lips came also the revelation of the beautiful infancy narrative. Now. Where do you think the origin of the infancy narrative of Christ that Luke explains? Um, no doubt uh, he had spoke to Mary herself concerning those things. Who else would you go to other than the mother who, who bore him in, in those moments? St. Dominic deeply loved the scriptures, especially the New Testament and St. Paul. His ready knowledge of the sacred text roused the admiration of his enemies and gave authority, originality, and conviction to his doctrinal preaching. After refreshing his body with food, we read that the holy man would retire to a solitary spot where, book in hand, he would read and make gestures as if in a conversation with an unseen companion. He did likewise with uh, traveling, for he always carried a copy of the scriptures in his knapsack. Uh, F.R.A., that might be Father, Father Angelico, has immortalized Dominic's passion for
for scripture by portraying him Bible in hand, sitting and meditating at the foot of the cross. Okay, I thought maybe that would be a picture of that. Yeah, this is this is so true though. I can't tell you how many times I just in contemplating something I'm speaking as if I'm speaking to somebody else. I'm, I'm formulating my words. I'm putting thoughts together and thinking through something. And the most humbling aspect of it is I sometimes I reflect on things that are so profound that when it comes to actually talking to a real person with those reflections, um, usually my, my study time has much greater depth to it. Um, but there's nobody around to hear it. Since Catholic theology rests on the written word of God as a primary foundation, this is very important for, for those who are not Catholic but are Christian in general, to know that the referential language of Catholic theology is scripture. It is primary, of course. It is the inscripturated uh, paradosis. Since Catholic theology rests on the written word of God as a primary foundation, Dominican liturgy and private tertiary devotion should also rest on that foundation. Sacred scripture, tradition, and the magisterium of the church are the sole infallible rule of the faith for the Dominican laity. At fixed periods of the day or night, tertiary should have recourse to the holy scriptures that they may learn the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ. Let them remember that prayer should accompany the reading of sacred scripture so that God and man may talk together. For we speak to him when we pray, we hear him when we read the divine sayings. St. Jerome declared that one who knows not the scriptures knows not Christ. The admonition of St. Paul to his convert Timothy is sound advice for the lay, for, for the Dominican laity. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching the truth, rebuking error, correcting faults, and giving instruction for right living, so that the man who serves God may be fully qualified and equipped to do every, to every kind of good work. The Dominican lady should develop special devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, our special protectress, to our Holy Father, St. Dominic, and to Catherine of Siena, patroness of the Third Order. What's kind of interesting is I was, before considering uh, pursuing or discerning a call to be a lay Dominican, I... Um, I already had a, a special devotion to Mary and a great interest in St. Dominic because Thomas Aquinas was a Dominican and um, uh, Catherine of Siena for some reason has always stuck out in my mind. Um, but let's take a look at the role of Mary. This may be harder for Protestants to understand, but... Um, I, th I think it's important to recognize that the that those who want to know what a lay Dominican is, that they do have special devotion to Mary. In fact, Dominicans are also often garbed in their robes, and instead of having a sword on on uh, on their belt, they hang um, a rosary. Right, that they hang a rosary from their their right hip, or left hip. I, I, I may, maybe it's specific uh, to whoever. Hey, Yoshi, welcome in. Never heard of the term. What the term Dominican, or some other term that I had comment upon. If it's the term Dominican, um, I I almost feel like when I tell people initially that yeah I'm going to my Dominican meeting tonight I, I have to tell them I'm not meeting with people whose native land is the 
Dominican Republic, right? For some reason, I feel like when that term is used, people aren't thinking about St. Dominic. They're not thinking about the Order of Preachers, which is the religious order in the Catholic Church that was started by Dominic Guzman. And so I kind of feel like, all right, in what context have most people have heard the, 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 the word Dominican? And that's the first thing that comes to mind for me. So I'm always explaining, like, no, this is actually part of a religious order like the Franciscans, right, or the Jesuits. Um, it's just another religious order. Um, uh, very well known because Thomas Aquinas was a Dominican. So um, that, that I have to kind of explain that. But once I explain at least that much, they'll be like, oh, okay, I didn't, I didn't know that um, the Thomas Aquinas, you know, his family wanted him to become a Benedictine, but he wanted to become a Dominican. So he kind of explained a story that way. And that, oh, I only oh, know, uh, I know Thomas Aquinas, right? Yeah. So that's why I wanted to make this video or dialogue about it. Which is definitely not going to be one of those, you know, five minute YouTube videos. It's it's more like a couple hours of just me talking and looking at this content. I'm actually reading through and commenting upon a pamphlet by uh, Father John Roba uh, entitled uh, Third Order of St. Dominic. Right. Yeah. All right. So our next part is Mary. So a uh, Dominican lady should love Mary as Jesus did. He chose her for his mother. Devotion to Mary is a biblical devotion as evidenced by the Holy Spirit who overshadowed her, by St. Joseph who accepted her as virgin and wife, by Gabriel who foretold her vital role in the incarnation, by St. Elizabeth who proclaimed her blessed among women, uh, which she did under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I might add. The veneration of Mary is basic to the Christian religion, as Vatican II declared by honoring her more than did all preceding councils of the church and declaring her to be the mother of the church. This is true. In Vatican II, there's, there's a section, um, uh, I believe it's the Constitution on the Church, and it's like the, the final chapter is all dedicated to Mary. And yes, it's true that uh, more was said of Mary within Vatican II than any other councils, as, as I've found out. As children of the Rosary, Dominicans should have a special love for her who was a God-bearer and a principal participant in the joyful, sorrowful, and glorious mysteries of the Rosary, since she is the mediatrix of graces for the people of God who are in her debt. And the prime example of this is her participation in the Incarnation. Uh, a lot of times people will look at the term mediatrix of graces and think that um, that is heresy that that takes away from Christ and no Jesus didn't just pop up out of nowhere she actually participated by the will of God in the incarnation came for us uh, all truth and grace and revelation and salvation so we owe all our debt to her for in as much as she participated in all of that you know, let it be done unto me according to your word. Right? It's very important that we give her the honor of her participation in our salvation. St. Dominic is our model of devotion to Mary. The Queen of Heaven appeared to him on various occasions and guided him in the f for f the foundation of the order. She called the brethren her friars and, um, she, and was seen blessing them on our primitive convents. Yeah. On one occasion, Jesus himself revealed his mother's preferential love for our order in a remarkable vision. Quote, I have entrusted your order to my mother. End quote. Whereupon Our Lady opened wide her heavenly mantle 
under which the patriarch uh, beheld a vast assembly of his children in glory. Now, of course, no Catholic is obligated to believe any private revelation such as this, but um, we take that with a grain of salt. Mary has intervened in the history of the order on many occasions. Uh, she cured uh, Blessed Reginald of a Reginald Reginald of a fatal illness and gave to him the distinctive habit of the order. Who's who's Blessed Reginald? That Reginald Garrigou Lagrange. Uh, he was a he was a Dominican, I think. His name was Reginald. Uh, there's a lot of Reginalds. Uh, anyways, um, during an invasion of the barbarian tar Tartars, Mary assisted St. Hyacinth, the Polish St. Dominic, in carrying her statue and the Blessed Sacrament across uh, the Dnieper River, Dryshod. Uh, Hyacinth, my son, rejoice, she once said. For your prayers are pleasing to my son, the savior of the world, and whatever you ask of him in my name, you will obtain through my intercession. Our, la Our Lady obtained for St. Albert the gift of perseverance in the order and rare charisms of science and wisdom. Among the greatest apostles of Marian devotion was the tertiary St. Louis de Montford, whose volume on true devotion is a classic in the field. What it means is that um, uh, St. Louis de Montfort Fort, wrote um, one of the greatest reflections on the devotion to Mary. Um, it's a, a Catholic resource. I don't own it myself. I've seen it. Um, I forget the, the name of it, but just Googling that name and Virgin Mary book would mostly yield uh, results for it. D Dominican tertiaries are clothed in the white habit of Our Lady upon reception into the order, and on the day of their profession explicitly place their lives in her motherly hands. The Rosary Devotion is an official apostolate of the Order of Preachers who are its greatest and traditional propagators. The little office of Our Lady was a part of the midnight office of the early friars and the Salve Regina has been sung at the deathbed of all Dominicans as a final tribute of affection for their heavenly protectress. That's cool. I've heard of the little office of Our Lady. It, it looks like the divine office or the liturgy of the hours um, structured in a very similar way. In fact, I think that along with the liturgy of the hours, there are prayers and feast days that are very specific to the Dominicans. So I got a little uh, um, supplemental volume so that on very specific days, I would use that instead of the general office. Right. So I'm just I'm learning a little bit more about that. But I, I think it's kind of neat that the little office of Our Lady uh, looks like was uh, involved in that. All right, St. Dominic. Of course, you can't talk about what is a lay Dominican without talking about St. Dominic. The Dominican lady nourish a tender affection for their father and Christ, St. Dominic, whose blessed Georgian of, Jordan of Saxony, the second master general of the order, they might say, he is the father of my soul. Pius, Pope Pius XI wrote, quote, we exhort religious to take as their model their own founder, their heavenly lawgiver, if they wish to have a sure and certain share in the graces which flow from their vocation, end quote. Dominic is des designated the doctor of truth and the preacher of grace. On one occasion, Saints Peter and Paul appeared to him, handed him a pilgrim staff and book, saying, Go and preach, because you have been chosen by God for this work. 
Now I will say I've I've never had any such encounters. You know, so it's 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 tough for me to read stories like that. You know, or uh, listen to what Saint Catherine of Siena wrote that Jesus conveyed to her in in a private uh, moment of devotion and um, be able to have a certainty that that's something I should consider. You take those things with a grain of salt, but you listen to the stories and just listen to them. Besides the many thousands of souls he won for Christ in Europe, he planned to evangelize among the pagan Tartars and suffer martyrdom for their salvation. To ensure the doctrinal content of Dominican preachers, he made study and learning obligatory uh, obligatory for his friars. He sent them He sent them to the great university centers of Europe, for which reason he was considered by I'm not going to say the name uh, Slaughter and others to be the first European minister of public education. He was the model and inspiration of doctors of the church, such as Thomas Aquinas, Albert the Great, and Catherine of Siena. Albert the Great. I, I thought Albert the Great was uh, earlier but I, I guess not. Contrary to the misrepresentations of many post-Reformation historians, our father and founder was gifted with a rare um, winsomeness and charm, which God himself praised in a revelation to the seraph of Siena when referring to Dominic as begotten by a sweet and tender adoption. Illustrative of the irresistible charm of Dominic's personality we quote brief testimonials from personal acquaintances. And I hope that upon my death, not just in an obituary or a eulogy, but people would have nice things to say about me. Maybe not as grand as some of these things, but to at least have made an impact upon the lives of others so that they would naturally, oh, a natural overflow of the heart would express these kinds of things. He was always radiant and joyous. None was ever more joyous than he, and none a better companion. He was always good to talk to when you were in trouble. He was always affectionate and quickly made you feel at home. Everyone who went to him came away consoled. Along the road, he had a word to say to everyone, even speaking to a group of Ger German pilgrims in their own language by the miraculous gift of languages or tongues. I have, which is the language of the Gentiles, for instance. I have a whole video explaining on that, a Catholic reflection on the gift of tongues or the gift of languages. I have never seen a man so humble or one who despised himself so greatly. He accepted insults, curses, and abuse with patience, even with joy. That's hard to do. I, When I suffer loss at the hands of others, my initial response is just like anger. And I'm distraught. You know, I, I want to get to the point where like and it says in the letter of James where he says consider it pure joy when you suffer all kinds of trials and tribulations for you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance and um, I know for instance that I struggle with faith in general so it, it makes sense I would also struggle with the means to strengthen it and in this case going through various forms of suffering. Um, I never heard him speak an idle or harmful word. He was pleasant to rich and poor, to Gentiles and Jews, of whom there were many in Spain. Sometimes he would walk barefoot among stones and sharp pebbles and exclaim in joy, this is part of our penance. <laughs> you know, living in a, uh, let me just say this, living in a society where we seek pleasure and comfort, which I, I have that as well. I have that tendency to want to seek pleasure and comfort, especially when I'm not feeling well, which seems to be a lot, you know. Um, but the, the idea of penance really comes down to not only 
receiving from God a comfort or a confidence in his presence or a peace that transcends all understanding, but also a disciplining of what can seem like a waywardness about ourselves, uh, the tendencies to seek pleasures even when we ought not to seek them, for instance, um, and to be, become more accustomed to s suffering and pain and discomfort. Um, I, I think, I, 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 you know, I, I need that in, in my life. I need those disciplines. And, and part of penance is fasting, and that's kind of what fasting does. But fasting can be all kinds of things. Like I remember one time I was I was living with a friend, and um, I was sleeping on a couch, and that's 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 where I slept every day. Well, my friend swapped with me for about a week, where I could sleep in his bed and he would sleep on the couch, so he can he can see what it's like from my perspective to not have his comfy bed but rather sleep on this couch. So um, that's the kind of thing I think we need to be drawn to, and it's not necessarily an easy thing to do. Uh, some other things that were said of him, he passed whole nights without sleep, sighing and weeping for the sins of others. Does that characterize anybody you know? I, I mean, I wish I cared that much. But, and the only reason why I, I, I don't or I wouldn't is because I struggle with my own stuff, you know, but that's, that's kind of part of the, the whole spiritual journey is to, to realize we're not the only ones on a journey. There are others on a journey as well. And we know just how much mercy and grace and divine assistance we need in the saving of our own souls that it, it leads us to great compassion for others who um, who need just as much grace, right? I've never known him to have any other bed than the church, for if there was no church, he lay on a bench or under the open sky. He fasted rigorously and was often so tired he slept sitting at meals. Okay, this is fascinating. He He'd be up all night and then, you know, come, come breakfast. He's, he's just <laughs> he's sitting there sleeping. Okay. Well, I, I suppose that's an easy way to fast. You're, you're sleeping through the meal, right? I'm not saying that's what he was doing, but he fasted rigorously. He always appeared joyous and smiling, except when moved to compassion by the affections of others. Empathy was the occasion of his miracles, healing the sick, multiplying bread for his penniless friars, raising the dead to life. It's the first time I'm hearing these. Um, that's quite fascinating and not too fantastic since Jesus made an outrageous claim that Christians would do greater things than these, meaning that, you know, the miracles and things that Christ did would not be uniquely his own, but would occasionally occur among Christians and through the ministry of others throughout the ages. At his prayer, a band of English pilgrims was saved from a watery grave when their overloaded boat capsized in the river, Garonne. A particularly edifying confession made by the saint to a close friend is worthy of mention. He said, quote, I am going to tell you something I've never told anyone else. Up to now, I have never in my life asked anything of God that I would not obtain as he promised, end quote. Among the last words recorded as he lay in his deathbed were, quote, thanks be to God whose mercy has preserved me in perfect virginity until this day. I shall be more useful to you where I am now going than I have ever been in, his, in this life. Have charity in your hearts. Practice humility after the example of Jesus Christ. Make voluntary poverty your riches. Look well to it that I am buried nowhere but under the feet of my brethren. 
And I'm going to take a couple minute break here. And then we're going to look at St. Catherine of Siena a little bit. And answering the question, what is a lay Dominican, is not just what are the activities of a lay Dominican today. It's, it's imbuing this spirit of the founders and, and those whom we look to, like St. Dominic and St. Catherine of Siena. I'll be right back. Okay, we're back. I think a natural question someone might ask, well, why look at the examples of the saints in the past? Well, one is to inspire us today, all right? The saints are kind of like the Hall of Fame in baseball, right? People aspire to be as good as a particular sports star same thing is true for Christians you know we we look to examples like the apostle Paul says you know follow my example as I follow Christ and this is certainly true of those who are like a father in the faith right those who have spent many years growing right Anyways, uh, Dominican uh, tertiaries love St. Catherine as a child loves its mother. This virgin and doctor, the uh, 23rd of 24 children, wow, that's a lot, was so loved by Jesus Christ that he exchanged hearts with her and espoused her with the words. This is spiritual talk, right? Just a connection, a devotion. I, your creator and redeemer, redeemer, espouse you in faith, and you shall... Uh, preserve it pure until we celebrate in heaven the eternal nuptials of the Lamb. The church in general is referred to as the the bride, the bride of Christ. So this imagery of you know each individual participating in in this spiritually is uh, important to understand in the language that's being used here. Her short life of 23 years. Uh, wait. 33, sorry, she was 33, was filled with amazing gifts of the Holy Spirit. Prophecy, healing, conversions, raising the dead, heroic service for the poor, for the sick and the dying, prophetic counselor, and cherished friend of popes, cardinals, royalty, sinners, and the oppressed. She is beyond doubt one of the world's greatest women, liberated in the loftiest sense of that term. 
It is not astonishing, then, that the church has honored her with the title and dignity of doctor, so that we may understand by her example her devotion to his church, her love of sacrifice, her simplicity and frugality and food. She was frugal. Uh, her constant prayer in the midst of trials, the sweetness of her character, her humility and unfailing kindness, the depth and beauty of her doctrine. St. Dominic loved his devoted daughter. When the Sienese tertiaries refused to accept her in the local chapter because of her youth, Dominic appeared to her bearing a radiant habit of the order and said, Sweet daughter, be of good cheer. Fear no obstacle, for most certainly you will wear this habit which you desire. End quote. Jesus called Catherine his sister by conformity of nature, friend by charity, dove by purity of soul and body. End quote. When marked with the stigmata of our Lord, she cried, Lord, grant at least that the wounds may not be visible. Her and by stigmata. For those who may not be familiar, there's this phenomenon that occurs among some of the saints' uh, markings. The markings of um, where Christ was pierced in the, the hand-wrist area. Uh, her mystical treatise, The Dialogue, in some 400 letters addressed to persons in every station of society are literary and theological gems. I thought about reading her book, Dialogue. Uh, her evangelical zeal make her a model of the tertiary vocation. Pius IX declared Catherine patroness of Rome with Saints Peter and Paul and with uh, Saint Francis of Assisi, she is patroness of Italy and of the Dominican lady. All right, so that's a little bit about St. Dominic, a little about uh, St. Catherine of Siena. Uh, tertiary should spend a quarter of an hour in mental prayer every day. Makes sense. Mental prayer or meditation should present no problem to a faithful tertiary. Mental prayer is simply focusing the attention and the affections on God or some divine reality. It is talking or listening to God with or without a fixed method. Observance of the tertiary rule is naturally conducive to mental prayer because it occurs during participation in the Mass and listening to the readings and thanksgiving after communion and singing hymns, praying the rosary or the office re reflectively. Mental prayer is private prayer and meditation as such, reasoning predominance. Uh, in mental prayer, pious affections predominate. Hence, the value of reading the scriptures attentively, gazing quietly at Jesus in the tabernacle, tabernacle, uttering short, fervent expressions or ejaculations during the busy hours of the day to experience the presence of God, raising the mind and heart to God in mental prayer. Essentially and helpful to mental essential and helpful to mental prayer for the tertiary are mortification of the exterior senses interior silence freedom from deliberate faults and inordinate affections which that's something you can't do on your own you need the grace of god since the degrees of prayer correspond to the degrees of charity a lively friendship with jesus will advance the soul from the vocal prayer of beginners to the higher levels of prayer characteristic of advanced souls Mental prayer is essential for the progress in the spiritual life. To mental prayer, St. Augustine attributed his conversion. Those sounds of the psalmody rang in my ears, and through them the truth entered into my heart, and tears flowed from my eyes. Tertiary should be familiar with St. Dominic's nine methods of prayer. I have no idea what that is. So let's see if it says anything about it. A companion, a companion testified, quote, I saw Dominic say Mass many times, and there was not a single time when he did not shed tears, end quote. Other witnesses stated that he would prostrate on the floor of the chapel and cry out, Oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He would spend a long time gazing at the crucifix, standing and genuflecting 
alternatively. He loved to pray with arms outstretched in the form of a cross as he did when he raised to life the boy Napoleon. He was often seen to reach toward heaven as if gazing with longing at the throne of God while repeating verses from the Psalms. Habitually, he would pass from reading to mental prayer and from mental prayer to contemplation. He employed all his faculties, even the deepest emotion during converse with God. When traveling, he would speak to God or of God or withdraw from his companions and pray with frequent signs of the cross and gestures as if in the presence of Jesus. Much of the night he spent in church passing from one altar to another, praying with groans and sighs, not realizing that he was being observed. He advised the novices, quote, If you have no sins of your own to weep for, weep for sinners in the world, end quote. He would be the first at midnight office and preferred to sing rather than recite the liturgy. His sermons moved listeners deeply because they were his contemplations verbalized. All prayer is good and pleasing to God, especially the Our Father, slowly recited in short, fervent expressions or ejaculations from the heart. If mental prayer presents a problem, recall the spontaneous cry of the Apostle, Lord, teach us to pray. Statute to 5b. When necessary or desirable, the entire rosary of 15 decades may be substituted for the for the oblation of daily prayer. The obligation of daily prayer. So there's daily prayers that the um, the, 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 the the Dominican uses. I don't think that um, this is still true, that you could do the entire 15 decades to substitute for something else. Um, it is required to do five decades a day, for sure, and other prayers as well. But whether one, whether 15 decades uh, can or cannot supplement additional prayers or the, 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 the non-rosary prayers um, is a matter of discipline that may or may not, you know, be retained. The great veneration which the friars preachers had for Our Lady in the Middle Ages caused the people to call them the Friars of the Virgin. In most recent times, Leo the Thirteenth, Pope Leo the Thirteenth, for those who don't know, author of weighty encyclicals, indeed, many of them very good, in letters on Mary's favorite prayer, the Rosary, added, quote, This devotion is the rightful property of the Dominican family and to the friars preachers is entrusted the commission to teach it to the Catholic world, end quote. Pope John Paul II, following the example of John the Twenty-Third and Paul the Sixth, was re, uh, has referred to the rosary as his favorite prayer. The rosary is dear to the, the Dominicans because it is dear to the Mother of God, who has recommended it so often and earnestly. The rosary is a biblical prayer which unfolds in 15 beautiful scenes the life of Christ and his incarnation, redemption, and resurrection. Our Lady lived the rosary. She contemplated Jesus in his joyful, sorrowful, and glorious mysteries. As a form of devotion, the rosary is so simple and practical that it can be prayed at any time and any place, all at one time or by dividing the mysteries. It expiates sin, releases souls from purgatory, obtains graces, and prepares souls for a happy death. Because of its vocal, mental, and contemplative aspects, the rosary is a perfect and universal form of prayer. St. Francis de Sales, doctor of the church, said that the rosary is the best method of prayer if it is said well. To prevent distractions during the recitation of the beads, a brief meditation may be made before or after each mystery, or the name of the mystery may be repeated in the middle of the Hail Mary after the name of Jesus. At Fatima, Our Lady of the Rosary re requested that this brief prayer be recited after each mystery. 
O my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those in greatest need, or uh, those in most need of thy mercy, as it's commonly said. The sacred apostolic penitentiary, penit uh, I'm bad with words so far. Granted permission of the inclusion of this beautiful prayer in the public and private recitation of the rosary. I, I use this prayer. It's called the Fatima prayer. I like it. Love for the rosary is the hallmark of the Dominican lady who are required by rule to pray at least five decades every day. Uh, propagating the devotion is an effective form of evangelization because it, is, because it is the proclamation of basic Christian doctrine. In the past, the rosary has saved the faithful. In the past, the rosary has saved the, the faith of nations in crisis, France, Northern Italy, Portugal, Ireland, Spain, Brazil, and Austria. It is the ideal prayer to obtain God's blessing on families and nations. A plenary indulgence is granted for praying the rosary in presence of the Blessed Sacrament or in special prayer groups, a partial indulgence otherwise. Blessed Alan of the Order of Preachers declared that the well-being and progress of the Order of Preachers is in proportion to its zeal in propagating this devotion so dear to the Mother of God and committed to it by the Holy See. Despite a temporary decline in the wake of Vatican II, the Rosary devotion is now regaining its former place of honor in the Church. Besides those Dominican monasteries where the Rosary is recited perpetually, numerous contemporary Rosary crusades and prayer groups are flourishing in various parts of the world. Among Marian devotees, special dev a mention should be made of the Sons of St. Dominic by tradition, the guardians and promoters of this very salutary practice, end quote. The Rosary Confraternity, entrusted to the Dominican Order by the Holy See, more than 500 years ago is a worldwide family of prayer which brings down many blessings on the people of God. And when it comes to the Dominicans' evangelization, this is a key point. Evangelization is not mentioned explicitly in the rule, but it is implied and strongly recommended by the church in our time. On uh, August 27, 1978, Pope John Paul I, of happy memory, in his first message to the bishops, declared, quote, We wish to remind the entire church that its first duty is that of evangelization, end quote. Basically, evangelization is the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the means by which people of the world become the people of God. Since, since Vatican Council II, there is a notable trend toward greater participation of the lady in the secular business of the world and the ecclesial administrations of the church. To share the gospel with the unchurched by means of television, radio, and the press is to share the ministry of Christ. It is the communication of truth, the Dominican ideal. What is truth? asked Pontius Pilate. In the reply in person, I am the truth, the way the life. In a remarkable vision, St. Peter and St. Paul once appeared to St. Dominic in the Basilica of St. Peter in Rome, presenting him with a staff and a book, commanding him, go and preach the gospel, for to you, for to this you have been called. Dominic's zeal was not confirmed, confined to Europe. He repeatedly petitioned the Holy See Principio Nucat Et in Secula Seculorum Good prayer in the background there. Sorry. He, he dispersed Adonic zeal was not confined to Europe. He repeatedly petitioned the Holy See for permission to evangelize the Cumin Tartars and win the martyrs, the martyr's crown. He dispersed his first friars to farthest corners of the continent. 
Pope John Paul II has urged the lady to engage in politics, a social milieu in which Catholics are pitifully non-vocal. Not me. Not me. Uh, not people like Michael Knowles, either. What woman was a greater evangelist than Catherine, St. Catherine of Siena, the irresistible Dyer's daughter? Dyer's, I think he dyed um, clothing with various colors was plunged furiously into the world of politics, pleading for social justice, for cessation of hostilities and reconciliation with the papacy and with one another through the divine mercy and the blood of thy son, sweet Christ Jesus. It was at the request of St. Raymond of Penafort that St. Thomas composed his Summa against the Gentiles, or the Summa Gentiles. The Sorry, Summa Contra Gentiles. It's, uh, it's the, the Summa against the Gentiles. For the, evangeliz- the evangelization of the Moors in, in Spain. And St. Vincent Fierer made many thousands of converts thanks to his charismatic gift of languages and expertise in the Arabic and Hebrew languages. Very good. Suffrage prayers for deceased Dominicans. Praying for other Dominicans. That's, that's how we started the stream off today. After a brief illness in the Dominican convent at Bologna, St. Dominic bade farewell to his weeping brethren and expired on August 6, 1221. He died in Friar uh, Moneta's bed because he had none of his own. And he died in Friar Moneta's tunic because he had not another which which to replace the one he had long been wearing. He was poor. Such was the death of the holy founder as described by this dude. Um, At the moment of his death, Friar Gula, prior of Brescia, I'm sorry, I... I don't know these places or names. Saul Dominic in vision being received into heaven by our Lord and our Lady. Equally impressive was the death of St. Catherine. This model and greatest of lay Dominicans spent her last days in the eternal city counseling her sweet Christ on earth. Urban the sixth and offering the intense suffering caused by her stigmata to her divine spouse. If I die, be assured the cause, sole cause of my death will be the zeal which consumes me for Holy Church. The hour of death is a paramount importance in the life of every Christian. No one is certain of heaven without a special revelation, says the Council of Trent. That doesn't mean you can't have moral certitude. It's just rejecting the absolute um, assurance all right, the, the presumption of, of um, the grace of, per, per, of, of uh, perseverance. Sorry, stumbling over my words. Uh, the hour of death, okay, no, uh, but, uh, even the, the prospect of purgur- purgatory is frightening. St. Louis Bertrand prayed eight years for his deceased father before he finally had the joy of beholding him enter heaven. For these reasons, the united prayers of all Dominicans throughout the world are a precious blessing for all deceased tertiaries. Suffrages for all deceased Dominicans, their parents, friends, and benefactors are part of the daily life of the order. After death, a tertiary may be clothed and buried in the full habit of the Dominican order or a scapular, if such be desired. The habit then becomes a last mute public profession of love and loyalty to the church and to the order. It is our lady's garment, a symbol of trust and affection for the sweetest of mothers. Chapter members are enjoined to participate as a group at the wake and to attend the funeral if possible. At the wake, the prayers of the Dominican funeral liturgy may be said, or the rosary or any prayer is suitable for the occasion. The office of the dead is recommended for recitation and chapter, substituting for the office of the day. These suffrages should be completed within eight days of notification of the secretary of the chapter. 
Every day all tertiary should say, and our Father, Hail Mary, and eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. May they rest in peace for all deceased Dominicans. Uh, once a year they should have offered or participate in three masses for the intention. The office uh, for the dead should be prayed also on the following days. Hey, Angel, welcome in. Good afternoon to you. Good to see you. Uh, let's see, All Souls Day, uh, February 7th, uh, for deceased fathers and mothers of all Dominicans, September 5th, for deceased friends and benefactors of the order, and uh, November 8th, for all deceased Dominicans. I don't have these written down somewhere. I'm sure I'll, I'll learn all the particulars as I go. It is a great consolation to realize that years after you and your dear ones have left this life, many thousands of Dominicans and our Holy Family will be praying for your eternal happiness and theirs. It is a family remembrance which guarantees that you and they will never be forgotten. You and your loved ones will rest securely in the minds and hearts of St. Dominic and his mitred children on earth and in heaven. The church grants a plenary indulgence to the, the Dominican lady who die wearing the scapular of the order and having it on their bed. A holy death is the well-deserved reward of a devoted life in the third order of St. Dominic. Oh, here's a question. So is this where Day of the Dead in Mexico comes from? I'm not familiar with the origins of the Day of the Dead, to, to be quite honest. Um, if you're referring to like All Souls Day or something like that. Um, it does make me wonder though, because normally on um, Halloween, which is All Hallows Eve, the day prior to um, All, uh, All Souls Day, uh, All Saints Day, sorry. All Saints Day, which is November 1st, and then November 2nd is All Souls Day. All right, so you have uh, Halloween, or All Hallows' Eve, then on November 1st you have All, Soul, uh, All Saints Day, then you have All Souls Day. Um, uh, but just the, the idea of being remembered and not forgotten um, it is certainly rooted in perhaps the Catholic influence um, in South America, there's a lot of Catholic influence in South America that may have influenced the, the, the idea of, um, of that. And it probably has their own local customs and stuff, kind of like how Christmas became Santa Claus here. Easter became about a rabbit. Uh, Valentine's Day was about giving chocolate and candy and notes to loved ones, um, uh, St. Patrick's Day is all about leprechauns and, you know, stuff like that. You know, I, I'm going to guess that maybe it has kind of a cultural expression that is sort of inspired by the actual, like, feast day in the liturgical calendar, it, which I, I find to be quite interesting that in America, you know, or at least, you know, uh, there, there are these cultural expressions that have been in, inspired by actual holy feast days in the Roman Catholic cal uh, liturgical calendar. Um, it's, it's just kind of curious to me how it becomes something else in, in a culture. Um, so I'm not quite sure uh, beyond that. That's, that's something I think it's worth looking into for sure. But it, it is indeed a good, you know, a consolation that you're, during one's life as a lay Dominican, one is praying for all of those in the religious order and knowing that when you die and go to the Lord, the religious order is going to continue to pray for you perpetually. Um, that's, that's very good, I think. They'll be praying for you. Uh, it is a family remembrance which guarantees that you and you will never be forgotten. You and your loved ones will rest uh, securely in the minds and hearts of St. Dominic and those. 
Uh, I liked this right here. Um, a holy death is a well-earned reward for a devoted life. I like that. Okay, we're getting to the the end of the document. So it says, okay, a chapter ordinarily meets once a month, at least to develop the Dominican spirit of its members and to receive instructions and inspiration from the director and each other. Uh, so this is kind of important. Uh, in addition to praying the rosary and reading scripture every day um, and praying for all Dominicans, among other things, uh, the, the lay Dominicans get together uh, once, a, once a month and we pray together. We play the uh, we pray the the divine office. So wherever you'd like, if it's during vespers, then then that's that's a part of the the the, the uh, divine office that that we pray and so on and so forth. Uh, Pope Benedict the fifteenth, a Dominican tertiary, once stated. Oh, I didn't know that. Anyways, uh, we know from history that when he was forming his first disciples to Christian perfection, St. Dominic thought of gathering a holy militia of pious lay folk to defend the rights of the church and to offer a strong resistance to heresies. Yay! <laughs> that was the origin of the Third uh, Order of Dominicans, which uh, by popularizing the way of perfection among uh, people living in the world was to bring a great glory and assistance to our Holy Mother Church. Um, I don't know if it's going to go into it right here, but maybe tomorrow or soon uh, we'll go over the first module for postulancy. Uh, there are six modules uh, that people go through during like the first six months of uh, participating in the lay Dominican meetings um, where we'll talk a little bit about the life of St. Dominic and the heresies like going against the Albigensians and stuff of his day and and whatnot so they were quite effective because how many uh, uh, Albigensians have you met lately all right let's see here all right uh that was the origin of the third order of D Dominicans which I read that. All right. These laymen and women clustering around St. Dominic and his friars throughout Europe were given a tertiary rule of life in 1285 by the Dominican master uh, general, uh, Munio Zamora, who took them under his jurisdiction and granted them the benefits of the order. Pope Innocent VII formally approved the rule of the brothers and sisters of penance of St. Dominic in 1405. The nucleus of the Dominican lady is the local chapter. Now, one thing to keep in mind when it comes to what's talking about the rule of life, um, uh, when it comes to the religious orders, there is a rule. And the rule is basically the structure or disciplines that form the community of people living together in monastery or convent and so on and so forth. It d determines prayers and devotions and disciplines and um, so it's like putting form to what a what a Christian already wants to do. All right, a Christian already wants to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, wants to emulate Christ in their life. They they want to worship God the Father, and what a rule does is helps to put some structure or some form to that development kind of like a, like spiritual disciplines or um, and how that gets applied to um, our daily life and growing in holiness and so forth so um, it's a way of doing it together with other people in a very particular kind of way and we've already talked about like the the uh, the special devotion to Mary and, and all those other things when it comes to the the Dominicans a chapter of the Dominican Lady is an authentic Dominican community drawn together by love of St. Dominic and the penitential life. Basically, divine charity is the golden bond of unity between all Dominicans on earth in purgatory and in heaven. It is the communion of saints in operation. When a chapter meets, a family meets. The closer the family ties, the more progress each member makes in the spiritual combat against personal failings, isolation, and discouragement. Just, just imagine, you know, uh, struggling with personal failings, isolation, and discouragement, but then entering into 
um, community with others who are, are trying to escape those same things, right? And try to grow in holiness together. In the mutual sharing of aspirations and apostolates, the unity of the brethren is firmly welded. When a beginner is received into a chapter, he or she is vested with a white scapular. I have no such thing, and given the, the title novice, I guess that's what I would be. If a novice is faithful to the rule and attendance at meetings for a full year formation, he or she is admitted to profession, which is a solemn promise to live in conformity to the rule for three years. This promise or commitment may be renewed for three more years or for life, which allows ample time for a final decision and growth in Dominicanism. Uh, attendance at meetings is expected. The absence of a member is like the absence of someone from a family uh, dinner table. It is felt by all. Absence from, absence from a meeting without reason is a fault against the rule. Repeated absences without reason is usually a sign of loss of vocation. It is far better not to join the order than to succumb to dissatisfying lukewarmness. Before committing oneself to a local chapter, it would be advisable to attend several meetings to decide if they measure up to spiritual expectations. There are different groups you can go to, right? You don't have to just go to one chapter meeting here and then just say, no, these people are just not good for me without attending others. I mean, if you're really called to it, you know, you're going to be patient with the process. And you're going to show up and you're going to participate. Chapter meetings are presided over by the president or the prior or the prioress and the spiritual director, usually a Dominican priest, which some don't have any Dominican priest that's involved, which is kind of unfortunate. There's kind of like a shortage of Dominican priests to be able to do that right now, especially in my, my own charter. The various apostolates and kindred subjects to strengthen the tertiary vocation and to develop the interior life. He also gives absolution from faults against the rule, which uh, never bind under sin. All right, so let's say that you fail to fulfill one of your pr your prayer obligations. All right, you've obligated yourself. I want to pray uh, v uh, vespers every night. And when you fail to do that, you're not bound under sin, but you you are at fault against the rule. This is the discipline of life that you've accepted, that you um, are willing to be formed by. And when you don't resign to that, you don't conform to that, then, you know, obviously that's you know, that, that's a problem that needs to be addressed. The meetings may last an hour or more and may include religious exercises such as hymns, recitation or chanting of the Liturgy of Hours or the Little Office of Our Lady, praying a meditated rosary, a spiritual conference by the director, a mass, a benediction, as circumstances permit, with an occasional business or recreational meeting. Or um, in the case of... Uh, mine, there's always some formation that is occurring as well. It might be kind of like a spiritual conference, I guess. When there is sufficient reason, a candidate may be received privately into the third order without being enrolled in any chapter. The, the reception of a private tertiary by a Dominican or other duly authorized priest and subsequent, subsequent professions are recorded in the provincial register. A year of preparation is required before profession during which the rule is studied and growth in the spirit of St. Dominic is evidenced. So there's there's a lot of things that govern all the little bits and pieces of the Dominicans as well. It's it's a well-oiled machine. It's, it's structured. It has some form to it, even when it comes to like the business aspect or organizational aspects of it, not just the uh, disciplines uh, for the holy life. Spiritual perfection is not a matter of rules and laws. A lively vertical and horizontal union with God and neighbor and charity is basic to any. It says basic to any religion, but I, I think it's referring to a religious order, the call to serve and love God. Saint Dominic insisted on a cheerful, reasonable observance of the rule, since human nature, being what it is, 
renewal for the majority lies more in the faithful observance of the rule and constitutions than in many new laws. St. Dominic's legislative insight was affirmed by God himself to St. Catherine of Siena, saying, quote, this is private revelation, but anyways, that is how your father organized his ship. He has given it a royal discipline. It is I myself, the true light, that thus enlightens him. My providence made provision for the weakness of the loss, for, for the less perfect. Dominic thus associated himself with my truth as not desiring the death of a sinner, but rather that he be converted and live. Therefore, his order is broad, joyous, and fragrant, a garden of delights. The aim and spirit of the Dominican lady is summarized clearly and succinctly in statute number five, the Book of Rules. Quote, the purpose of the third order, or uh, the lay or secular order, is the sanctification of its members and others. The spiritual life of tertiaries is guided by norms willingly accepted by mean, as means to that end tried and proven to be effective by more than seven centuries of experience. These obligations offer several variations. None of them bind under sin. They are followed freely by joyful hearts, never to be regarded as rigid routines that threaten conscience or peace of mind. They are the spiritual bonds of unity with fellow tertiaries and their Dominican forebears. All right, a little bit about the governance of the lady here, uh, just because we're being thorough. Uh, the supreme head of the order of preachers is the master general, whose headquarters are in the historical convent of Santa Sabina, on the Aunt Aventine Hill overlooking the Vatican in Rome. He is the elected head of the entire Dominican family under the master general and subject to him as a promoter general of the Dominican lady whose jurisdiction extends to all tertiaries in the world. The Dominican order is divided into provinces and a particular nation may have one or several Dominican provinces. In the United States, there are three provinces. Um, I think there's four now, but uh, the provinces are governed by a provincial who appoints a provincial promoter of the third order with jurisdiction over the various uh, tertiary chapters in the province. So you just, just there's just general structure right, of how the order works for the lay Dominicans. And in the province, there are usually many local chapters governed by a president, a prior, a prioress, and other officers. A chapter council of three or more members is elected by the professed members of the chapter as the representatives. The government of the entire order is based on the principle of democratic representation in elections, superiors or executives, now legislators. So systematically, the hierarchy of tertiary officers councils is the master general, the general promoter of the entire third order, the provincial, the provincial uh, promoter of the province, and then the, the president of the chapter. <clears throat> All right, some of the benefits during life of being a lay Dominican. One, you become a full member of the, of the Dominican family as a lay member of a major religious order. Two, you enjoy a privileged place in the church. Three, you have St. Dominic for your father and all the Dominican saints for your brothers and sisters. Four, you share the prayers, penances, and good works of Dominicans throughout the world. Five, you gain plenary and partial indulgences under the usual conditions as listed in Appendix 2 of the rule book. Uh, do I see a 3 after 5? Oh, oh, okay, well, well. anyways, let's, <laughs> let's not be too distracted by the, the, the strange numbers here. You benefit from spiritual conferences on the interior life. You enjoy the society of fervent lay, lay folk. In sickness and sorrow, you have the support of special chapter prayers. Uh, due to the influence of the liturgy, the sacraments, and adherence to the rule, you avoid the occasion of sin and rise promptly when you fall. And the above spiritual benefits are perpetual within the order. And some consolation at death. 
Uh, your daily rosaries are an efficacious preparation for death. On the day you die, if you wear the scapular or spread it on your bed, you gain a plenary indulgence under the usual conditions. You may, if you desire, be uh, buried in the full Dominican habit. This permission is not granted during lifetime without permission of the local ordinary. The chapter will assist in the absequities. I, I don't know this word, I'm sorry. Your soul benefits from the masses, prayers, and penances of all Dominicans uh, long after your relatives and friends have forgotten you. In heaven, you enjoy your special relationship with all the Dominican saints and elect in, uh, in glory. So let's look at the principal obligations. So, okay, we talked about St. Dominic. We, we talked about St. Catherine of Siena. We talked a little bit about uh, having a ministry or having an apostolate. Um, we talked a little bit about the, the hierarchy or structure. Uh, we've talked about, the, you know, uh, emulating the lives of, of saints and so on and so forth. But when it comes down to it, well, what exactly do you do on a daily basis? Well, what makes a lay Dominican different than, say, anybody else who might be Catholic or otherwise? So to fulfill the um, uh, obligation of daily prayer, you should pray a liturgical office and the five decades of the rosary. So um, let me just read this and I can make adjustments. So daily, you recite the uh, the divine office uh, or the little office of the Blessed Virgin or another little office or 15 decades of the rosary or five decades of the rosary if one uh, is impeded from doing more. So g generally you play you pray lauds and vespers as part of the, the divine office which is the liturgy of the uh, off, uh, of the, the hours. It's morning and evening prayer. Now right, you do that. You also do you pray the uh, uh, the rosary five decades. Right. Uh, also, uh, an Our Father, a Hail Mary, and an eternal rest for all Dominicans living and deceased. You pray for other Dominicans every day. Uh, Fifteen minutes of mental prayer, reading the sacred scriptures, may replace the citation of the office. Uh, one way of doing this is just to do the office of readings in the in the liturgy of the hours, because there's scripture readings there. Um, there is a scripture reading there. So, uh, also, mass and communion daily, if possible, is recommended. It's recommended. If you can't do it, then don't. And it doesn't matter if you haven't been to confession or if you can partake of the Eucharist, just be there, right? Just be there if you can. Uh, monthly, uh, confession at least once a month. Uh, if you're struggling with habitual sin, uh, then go every week. Just take that to confession every week. Also, participation at the meeting of the chapter, so you get together with all the other lay Dominicans once a month. Yearly, you assist at or have celebrated three masses for all Dominicans living and deceased. If this isn't in your area, I think this is waived. You don't have to travel hundreds of miles to be able to do this. A fasting and vigil of the Feast of St. Dominic, St. Catherine of Siena, and the Holy Rosary, insofar as this may be possible. If you don't have any medical condition or you're too old or something like that. Um, Basically, the idea is just on these particular feast days, you also do fastings. Uh, some practices that are recommended, annual retreat of three days or a single day of recollection, uh, abstinence on off Fridays of the year, or some special penance. So it could be fasting or it might be uh, or not eating meat, uh, or it could be giving up something that is important to you. Modesty and dress, recreation and avoidance of worldliness. I think that goes without saying when it comes to Christianity. A personal apostolate of good works, prayer, suffering. Uh, it's, it's important to actually have a ministry of some sort where the formation that you're undergoing overflows to impacting the lives of those around you. Uh, for me, that is primarily through my role as a husband and a father in my own home 
and creating a Catholic Christian environment. Um, that's that's my primary apostolate, for example. But I also do stuff like like this, where I where I talk and converse with people about a subject. Um, also involvement in the objectives objectives of Vatican II, and that probably has to do with evangelism, which is related to an apostolate and so on and so forth. Um, uh, as for what is the tertiary ideal? So the Dominican lady are committed to strive for perfection, the perfection of the gospel. The call to this perfection is supernatural, universal. Be ye therefore perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. A great Wesleyan uh, a verse talking about perfect love. If God summons the tertiary to perfection, he gives sufficient grace to achieve it. All right. Uh, Jesus does not mock us. He, he has faith in our human nature. He knows our weakness, but he has said, with God, everything is possible. Tertiaries do not seek perfection on their own strength. It's so easy to fall into that self-reliant attitude. I think it's just natural for many of us. Uh, since they are called, they are helped helped by stirring up the grace within them and guided by the rule which the Holy Spirit has given them. The perfection of the gospel is the perfection of charity, right? perfect love. God is charity, and he that abides in charity abides in God and God in him. Filled with this charity, the Dominican lady must take up the renewal of the tempor temporal order as their own special obligation, cooperating with other citizens and seeking the justice of God's kingdom. Their every action can become vital expressions of charity. This summons to perfect charity, perfect love, creates a Trinitarian dimension, a golden chain which binds God, the tertiary, and the neighbor in a, a, an eschatological oneness. The charity of the tertiary is the fulfillment of God's law and the tertiary rule. Self-sanctification is perfected in giving to others the fruits of personal contemplation. Goodness, like evil, is self-diffusive. Somebody's unhappy upstairs. Yeah, we are almost done here. Comparing the order of St. Francis with that of St. Dominic, our Lord told St. Catherine, each order excels in a particular virtue. Poverty belongs especially to my poor man Francis, who placed the principal foundation of his order in, in love of this virtue. Your father, Dominic, my son, wished that his sons would apply themselves only to my honor and the salvation of souls by the light of science, uh, which light he laid on his principal foundation in order to expiate the errors which had uh, arisen in his time thus taking upon him the office of my only begotten son, the Word. He was a light which I gave to the world through Mary. At what table does he feed his sons with the light of science? At the table of the cross. It serves the best interest of the church for communities to have their own special character and purpose. Therefore, loyal recognition and self-keeping should be accorded to the spirit of the founders, as also to all the particular goals and wholesome traditions which constitute the heritage of each community. All tertiaries are not equally capable of, of effective apostleship or lofty contemplation. Their apostolates naturally differ in kind and, and degree, and the Holy Spirit leads them gently to himself without uh, detriment to their freedom or personhood. The degree of grace and glory may differ in the measure of their conformity to the spirit of the rule which is the exterior expression of God's will for them. Hold to thy rule, keep it, for it is thy life. Lay Dominicans must build on the foundations of the heroes and heroines of the order of preachers till we become one in the faith and knowledge of God's Son. On the twin wings of charity and divine science, Rose of Lima became the spouse of Christ and the first canonized tertiary of the New World. Blessed, it looks like it's a list of various names that I can't pronounce. Blessed Cybelina, blind 
spent 64 years praising God in a tiny hermitage uh, and joining a church of the friars. Blessed Albert of whatever, a widower, kept the spirit of the rule inviolate as he wandered in pilgrimage from shrine to shrine in Europe and the Holy Land. Uh, Blessed Mary, tertiary invalid, uh, achieved perfection on a bed of pain during an entire lifetime. Blessed Margaret, uh, deformed, blind, lame, rejected by her parents, groped her solitary way to God through endless humiliations, motivated by charity and the spirit of forgiveness. Uh, Blessed Dominic, uh, wealthy Vietnamese tertiary and father of a son martyred during the persecutions of the past century, made his home a refuge for Christian martyrs and was beheaded at the age of 80 rather than trample on a crucifix. Following is a remarkable letter smuggled by five young Vietnamese tertiary novices imprisoned in a tiger cage before being sentenced to death in defiance of their faith. We cannot but admire their loyalty to the, the Dominican ideal. And this is literally the last thing looks like. We are all five novices of the third order and we can observe the fast prescribed by our rule on most days but not always we therefore beg father to extend some indulgence and pardon his children moreover we ask to be allowed to make a profession according to the said rule of the third order and request father to admit and receive our profession here written as if we made it in his hands therefore to honor the the Therefore, to the honor of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we, Francis Xavier, Dominic, Thomas, Augustine, and Stephen, in your presence, Reverend Father John, in place of the Most Reverend Master General of the Order of Friars, Preachers, and of the Third Order of Penance of St. Dominic, uh, make profession and promise to live according to the rule and constitutions of the Third Order of St. Dominic, and t- even until death. All were strangled to death on December 19, 1839. There was perfected in glory in heaven. So anyways, there's a lot to the Dominican order. There's a lot of history. There's a lot of structure. There's a lot of uh, disciplines. Um, just all kinds of stuff. Um, I will put a link to what I worked through today in the description. And... Um, uh, thanks for hanging out. Thanks for uh, some of the chat and participation. And uh, we will see you next time.